So when you lay your rifle down and you go home, and you're sitting across from the person you love or the person you trust more than anyone in the world, and that person looks at you and says, tell me the truth, tell me what it was like, what are you going to say? I'd tell him, some days it's, you get a win, and some days you don't. And the days you don't seem to be more than the days you do. In March of 2003, coalition forces invaded Iraq. Seven years later, more than 100,000 American troops are still there. In 2008, I picked up my camera and headed back to the big sandbox and met up with Baker Company of the 115 Infantry. I made a deal with them. I'm willing to die with you if you're willing to talk to me. This is what I saw. Attention! All right, listen up, so there's a lot of change going on over the next uh, next day or two as we get ready to move down to another area. I was down there this morning. The dirt is still there. The rubble buildings are still there. We're approximately 90 days from going home, and uh, I was given the uh, the order that uh, Baker Company would be assuming a new position and uh, having the opportunity to, uh, to bound south and uh, start a new uh, combat outpost. Uh, the challenge that we have as a company is that we have to move out of an area that we've worked in for eight to 10 months and uh, move to an entirely different area, which is, uh, is not as secure as this one that, we've been, uh, that we had been living in. It's gonna be a great experience to get down there. You won't think it is now, but later when we get back to say, you know what? We fixed an area and now we're moving to a whole other battle space and we're going to have a huge impact and plant the Baker Company guide on and a whole other AO and affect a whole other spot. The boys were torn uh, as a, they know, they've heard the stories of the area we're going to as it's not a very safe area and uh, obviously instant concern for their, for their well-being and a little bit of, uh, you know, hey, why are we moving now? Uh, we're, we're so close to going home. We got to get the game face on and get ready to go down. Business as usual, go down there and get business uh, handled, and we'll get on home and tell these war stories over a couple beers. Okay? All right. Company. Hey. Attention. As soon as we get in the area, I expect somebody to try us. We're the new guys on the block, um, and I expect somebody to try us. And as soon as they try us, uh, we have to be able to respond. Uh, with, with lethal force and kill uh, who, who that is that's thinking they want to try us and, uh, and set the tone immediately. I'm Specialist Ariel Quijano. I was born in Philippines. I'm 21 years old. What did you want to be when you grew up? Actual lawyer. I wanted to go into business. I wanted to, I wanted to be an astronaut. I mean, whatever little boy wants to be. I never had army on the mind. Never in a million years I thought army. I'm like, army? Who the hell want to join the army? You know, I want to be told what to do. Fuck all that shit, so. Specialist Aaron Christopher Hanker from St. Andrew, Iowa, 21 years old. My name's uh, Sergeant Jose Alberto Gutierrez. I was uh, born in Brooklyn, New York. Paul Marion Brawley, 27 years old. Uh, currently, my family lives in Corona, California. Mm. What did you want to be when you grew up? Soldier in the Army. Really? Yeah, since I was a little kid. My dad was in the Army for 23 years, 
and uh, I've got five older siblings. None of them were ever interested, but it got to me, and I got all jonesed every time my dad would tell me a story, or I'd find some kind of clothing in the garage or metal somewhere. My name is Sergio Reyes. I'm from South Central California, South Central LA. I'm 20 years old and I'm in third platoon. I'm a second squad saw gunner. What's a saw gunner? This is a fucking saw right here. Private first class Bankston from uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Specialist James L. Foreman, come to you live from Iraq. A specialist Downs from uh, Woodstock, Virginia. From Columbus, South Carolina. From Bentone, California. In Yuma, Arizona. From Sealsby, Texas. Greenville, Texas. From Menor, Ohio. Growing up in LA, I wanted to be just like a few of my cousins were, you know, these great street thugs, gangsters. But uh, another part of me, ever since I was little, I wanted to be in the army. I wanted to be a soldier, so I got to realize that dream. I was by myself when I went to Iraq and I had like five Backpacks, huge backpacks of shit. And I remember getting into a Blackhawk chopper from a forward operating base to head out to um, Cahill to meet the Baker boys. And I remember getting on this chopper in the middle of the night and feeling, what the hell am I doing here? I'd spend a good portion of my life in places people call war zones and had dropped out of it and quit, didn't want any part of it. And I, I saw these American faces on, on television. Thousands of American soldiers dead, tens of thousands injured. Thousands more were coming back with emotional and mental disorders. And you look at their faces in the newspapers, on the TV screens, and you can't see them. And I just wanted to find out what they were thinking. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I thought it was worth the risk to go over there and ask these kids, what do you think? What do you feel? All right, real quick, guys. I know we got a few things to get done right before we leave. I just want to reiterate that uh, obviously we're leaving Cahill for the last time today, going down to set up a new place. Expect that within you know, a few hours, somebody's going to see that we've become the 800-pound gorilla sitting in their backyard, and they're going to want to come uh, see who we are and what we're there to do. It's day one of an 88-day deployment is what it is, all right? It's not day 290-something or whatever it is of a 14-month deployment. It's day one, all right? Let's go out there and get it done for about 88 days, no problems, and get on home. All right, guys, have a good one. Damn, dude. In this area, 50 miles south of Baghdad, the Baker Boys were the spearhead of the counterinsurgency surge. Their mission was to move deep into the Badlands, build a combat outpost, and turn the local Iraqis from enemy to friend. With orders like that, and only 90 days from going home, no one in Baker Company was taking a minute of this mission for granted. It's official, Cobb Cobble. Hey, 6 Delta 6, Lima Charlie. They're coming down this road right here. We yeah, are here. 
Sergeant actually pointed that road out to me earlier. We are, they're just, the river and I'm road. just done, they're not stopping. They just, there's like a lot. Every time you look, there's another six. You got about five or six that dart across this field and we lose them right here in this dead space. And they're actually getting in trucks coming up, backing up. My guess is they're just reconning us, seeing what, what all we got going on. We're here at our new combat outpost carver. See right here. The problem is we got a road right here and bad guys travel up and down on this road. So we're putting in a berm, as you can see right here, to keep us separated from the bad guys. Cop Carver, our new home. Bad guys are out there, we know they're watching us. We just moved into their home. <laughs> it's ours now. If they try anything, we can take care of that. But, uh, you gotta build this place up. Lieutenant Eno had called and said how many days you need to pack for. I said, you know, we better pack for the be here a minute, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anything can happen, we better pack for the be here a minute. They see us here, they're gonna try something. So yeah. I, I would bet, I bet me. Now if they don't, that's good, but if it was me, I'd test it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a squad in my platoon that has a mascot, Teddy. Me and Sergeant Brawley found that guy. It was a little doll's head. We found him on the very first dismounted patrol. We call him the War God. We need a safe trip, right? Yeah. As you can see, we've all got arms, limbs, and everything attached. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. Teddy learned to quit while he was ahead. Yeah, <laughs> no pun intended, Teddy. <laughs> Instead of sitting there, Going over in our mind, oh my god, I can't believe Sergeant Coombs broke his back. I can't believe Daniel and Parrish are hurt. I can't believe Garz is not coming back. I can't believe Shelton got hurt and is going home, things of that nature. It, it gives us a chance to think, <clears throat> Teddy should have a girlfriend. We should find him a girlfriend. What would her name be? Venus. Yeah. Are you fucking ready? All right, today we're going to do a soft knock of uh, Derea 1. All right, should we take contact, of course we'll return fire, a lot of fire, kick in the closest door, secure a foothold, and we'll uh, make an assessment from there. And make sure you got all your protective gear, your helmet, your eye pro, your hearing protection, throat protector, groin protector. Don't get it twisted, all right? When you get down there, make sure you got your gun barrels in each alleyway. The only person that should be smiling and shaking hands should be the uh, uh, blue one. Be alert, be vigilant, be ready to kill at any moment. Everybody understand? Any questions? If I got anything else to add it, I might have missed. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you joking, man? <laughs> Took the drag on a cigarette. <laughs> hey, Brawley. Alright. War guys, mount up. A lot of people give me slack for my guys. I, I keep them relaxed. But it's so funny to see them just, you know, just as soon as you hit the switch, the light comes on. And just as soon as they hear a crack, they're just whooping ass. I mean, it's just, it's arousing. It's just, I don't know, I, I love it. I, I love that feeling. The feeling you get on the road, just driving, waiting. You know, you, you're sitting there waiting, thinking to yourself, you know, is it gonna blow up now? Five minutes from now, if at all. You know, so it, it definitely keeps you on your toes. It's pretty cool. I saw a video on YouTube, and this explosive flipped a Bradley. You know, I'm like, holy shit, that's fucking 32 tons. And this explosive flipped it like it was nothing. You're driving around the town, and you've got kids waving, and you know, miss and miss it, or chocolate, chocolate, and then the road explodes. And the vehicle in front of you doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that's, that's such kind of shit I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna think about, but I have to, because that, that could be me. You know, them fuckers could be videotaping me getting killed. Have some like if he's got a place or somebody in the village that he wants me to meet with uh, that represents the village 
Um, I'd like to go there and then have the rest of my guys kind of visit the houses. Um, yeah, follow. Okay, thank you. Anything is missing? Any water? Any food? Anything is really hurt? We're confused the Arab people. The way we came here, the way we came here, and the the people here are living here. We're 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 we're going to try to help get water to come in here. That's what we're here for. We're here to help the community and the families. Yeah, we're going to try to help the community and the families. We're going to try to help the community and the All right, so we're in a new town. Never been here before. We got a meeting going on. We got an enemy in the area all over the place. We're not really sure where they're at. Shaking hands and kissing people's asses. Kind of gets irritating after a while. You see able men not helping out, but nothing we can do about it. Just tell me what you think when you come to a new place and you see the locals. Same faces. They all look the same to me. It's a new place. Just trying to get closer back to get home. There's a saying in Iraq that it takes seven meetings to get one thing done. Um, I, I never really found it took seven meetings for me. Uh, maybe it's because I just couldn't wait that long. I, I had a job to do and uh, you know, and when there's those uncomfortable pauses, why not throw in a, uh, a relevant question and, and start the topic? Uh, and it's worked um, <clears throat> so far. The, uh, we, we start the, uh, the discussions and the, um, and the dialogue begins. And, and the next thing you know, you're in a, you've got a, group, a room full of people, a group of people. Uh, you know, that you find out, you know, two, three, four months ago, we're shooting at each other, and now they're the leaders of, of in the immediate area, for, especially for a company area, and uh, you realize your first big success was simply getting them to put their guns down and come into one room. <laughs> مليون وكسور دينار عفته أكلت طير يعني ما قدرنا نروح لأن الطيارات قصفت السيارات اللي كانت على عبرة إذا يصير أي خارقة أو أي فشي هو راح يجي بلغنا يقول لي أبا ترى من الوجه المقبول أكثر قبولا هو هذا اللي يريده Somebody's going to be voted out, and the, those that are not going to be voted in need to be seated, seated in the room to see how this process came about so that they know that it wasn't me that picked the leader, that it was actually the Iraqi decision and vote that picked which leader was going to run the program. We'll, we'll continue to work through the leadership, and uh, I'll talk with Sheikh Kareem and some of the other uh, leaders of the area about how I set up the programs uh, to make sure that no one group is in charge of the other groups, but they all are equal and work work together. The easy solution is just to go around and killing a lot of people. All of us can do that. We've got enough firepower, we carry enough guns, we carry enough ammunition. The, the unique thing this time over here was to kind of get into the interper interpersonal skills that are required to talk to the leadership and get the Iraqis to, to, to take control of the Iraqis and, and let them kind of come up with their own solutions and just kind of get to the point where we're just merely arbitrating the minute details and taking that opportunity to, to get them to come to the table and talk. The funny part is every one of those people want to kill us all. You're over here risking your life in one of the most dangerous places on the planet. And back home, opinion polls say the American people don't think this war is worth it anymore. How does that make you feel when you hear something like that? 
a little frustrated. I mean, a lot of people just don't see the good that's coming out of it right now. They don't see what, what we've done so far, how far we've come. It's been going on for a while. I mean, we've, we've been in this country for years and years. How can people keep that at the foremost of their mind? We're still in Afghanistan. If you walk down the street and ask people about Afghanistan, I guarantee that there's people that don't even realize we have soldiers in Afghanistan. Don't even realize that there's still combat conflict going on there. So I'm not surprised that people are uh, losing interest in Iraq. That's what makes America great, is you're free to do that. You're free to say you don't like something, and it's okay to say you don't like something, but uh, uh, Americans, I think, should try to do what's right no matter what. Whether people know it or not, you know, and whether people agree with this war or not, and whether people agree with the president or not, you know, regardless of all the other bullshit, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, if we're, if we're able to stop an issue that's happening over here from coming over there, then we are doing something for everybody, you know. So to all the unappreciative motherfuckers, you know, who, who, who are sitting home, you know, with their families and, 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 and watching the news and, and cursing the soldiers and all that stuff, fuck y'all. But for everybody else who is appreciative, you know, we do this for y'all. And we do this for the unappreciative people as well, you know. We're fighting for all these people, not just some. We can't pick and choose who we're fighting for. That's not what we do. We just fight, that's all there is to it. The Baker boys had only been in this new area a couple of days when the local sheikhs rounded up a couple of guys and dropped them off as a peace offering. They were Al-Qaeda. They tried to hide it, but Captain Thompson knew who they were. Ask him. Are you Al-Qaeda? Work with Al-Qaeda? Work with Al-Qaeda? I know. I if you don't have a tribe in the area, what are you doing in the area? Tell him that he needs to just lay back. We'll take care of him. We'll ask him questions later on. I'll bring my camera next time. We can have a family photo. Why are you smiling? You're still hot. These two are associated with Al-Qaeda in the southern peninsula, both attacks on uh, the Sons of Iraq and coalition forces. This gentleman here has been known to uh, attack coalition helicopters with Dushka fire and uh, also small arms fire. This other gentleman, I believe that he is a uh, he's just associated due to proximity. Um, they uh, live in the same neighborhood and they're part of the same tribe. They're smug because they don't think we know, but they don't know how much we know. This guy is, is trying to act cool and calm, but uh, he's probably the pinnacle of badness in this area. Should he lift one finger in front of my face, I can, I can promise you that myself and any other soldier would, would uh, be more than happy to uh, put a bullet between his eyes. They have been brought to the cop from the Sons of Iraq, which, are, uh, which is great progress because the, the locals are starting to police their, uh, their own villages and identify the bad guys and bring them to coalition forces so uh, they can have justice in their own villages. And they'll follow, they'll follow him in his truck. In this direction? Yeah, down to the okay. right. Okay. Just getting in there and kind of seeing, seeing the people, letting them get used to seeing you again. No problem. You ready, Adam? Hey, Ford, just let me know if everybody's good. We'll come over there. The Sons of Iraq were organized by local sheikhs to set up checkpoints around villages. These checkpoints not only provided security for the villages, 
They also established a perimeter of security around the Baker boys. So the Baker boys had to go out now and then to make sure those checkpoints actually existed. What we're gonna do today is hopefully go out, get ourselves some native Iraqis. <laughs> Ready when you are, sir? Hey, this white one. We're just waiting on uh, a magic element. Throw him, is He's Russian. No one really <laughs> likes him. Liking me is not a requirement. Roger, copy. Moving now. All right, they're good. Let's go. Who else knows how to drive this bitch as good as I do? Nobody. Nobody. Got the wife preparing. She went up, bought me two cases of beer yesterday. She said every month she's gonna buy me two cases. That way I got something for that first three days well, when I'm home. I'm telling you, I told her already when we land, I had that bottle of Grey Goose ready for the squad because yeah. we will all be doing a shot. And McDonald's, oh, yeah. Papa John's, the garlic sauce with the oh yeah. Oh. Make sure there's no checkpoints on that road. No, Marco. No, Marco. No, Marco. Say Tarat. Say Tarat. Fuck out the last shot. Just on the dumbest. Okay, so tell him we'll go walk and check him out. Okay. The reason they walk with the shakes is to find out about the town. One of the reasons. We'll see. The other reasons I'm not really sure. I just kind of walk back here and pull my security with my squad and make sure nothing happens to the LT. Hey, this one, uh, be advised, there may be the same checkpoint that we checked on yesterday. Adam, what's up? Mm -hmm. يعني شلون تعبانين من من it's 11. Okay. Yeah. Adam, I need to know if there are any checkpoints in that direction that we haven't seen yet. There's nothing on the other side of the road. Okay. So there's a checkpoint up further yeah, up this road? Yeah, beside the camp. This area without any checkpoints from this direction. So it's open area. You should think of our base as one big checkpoint for his village. You should think of our base as one big checkpoint for his village. Nobody comes into that area without us seeing them. Hey, this one, we're going to start heading back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. village is very safe. Hey, great. Thank you very much. Shukran Jazeera. We'll be spending a lot of time here. Inshallah. Just to make the place safe. All right, Adam, you can go ahead and load up. Okay. Yalla, I'm going to show you how to do it. Hello. Hello. They're all fucking full of shit. Every last one of them pointing at another village telling us, oh, it's safe, it's safe. We were in four firefights there the last month and a half. Every single one of them. Oh, shit. Two good reasons for walking with shakes. Yeah, two good reasons walking with shakes. If you get shot at, they're the first ones to die, and you don't actually get any useful information whatsoever out of the village. We need to talk to other people. Go ahead and get loaded up. Give me it up when you're Redcom 1. Hey, drop ramp. Tell them we don't want any of these kids right, to get good. hurt if one of our guys tell them it's very dangerous for the kids if they throw rocks at us. Tell them I take this very seriously. I take the safety of my guys very seriously. Tell them that when they wait for us to get in vehicles and then they pick up rocks and then they throw them at us, tell them that's not a good thing. Tell them. I understand. Eyes. Yeah. You know? This rock can hit us in the eye. Very sorry, very sorry. Very dangerous for them. No 
joke, we've been in four firefights in the last two months in that hood. Al Qaeda just shooting at us day and night. You know, and I'm looking at these shakes. I'm like, so. You know, no problems with that village up there, no al Qaeda up there in the last two months. Never been any problems with the Americans in that area. No, no problems, no problems. Nothing in the last couple of months, no problems. I mean, we killed guys with 25 in that freaking town. And then we get back to our, to our vehicles in the freaking main town. We can't even mount up without kids starting to throw rocks at us and stuff. So, you know, obviously we got out, you know, talked to the shakes about how dangerous it is for the kids to freaking be throwing rocks at us and stuff. But it's frustrating. And just frustrating. My wife is not gonna like this. <laughs> Man, she really, she ain't gonna take this shit at all. How important is laughter in Iraq? Laughter is very important. Very important. That guy, uh, Royal, we call him Cheese. This guy does all kinds of impersonation, all kinds of crazy shit. What we have here <laughs> is a Mexican out of his natural habitat. Usually they're, you know, they're in Guatemala, maybe Mexico, but no, this one's special. He's in that rock. <laughs> maybe you might do his death roll. This, this magnificent photo. <laughs> My daughter, I just say he's a very strong Mexican, which makes him a good worker. How important is laughter in Iraq? <laughs> it's fucking everything out here. You lose your mind without you know, trying to maintain your sense of humor. You have some sense of being yourself, as well as a soldier. If you don't laugh, then you'll start to remember that you're pissed, that you're sad, that you're hungry, that you're tired, that your back hurts, that your legs hurt, that your feet hurt, that there ain't no chow waiting for you when you get back, <laughs> that the air conditioner is broke. So, so you gotta laugh just to keep yourself from going crazy or shooting somebody. And I did not see anything about this when I signed that dotted line. I came in Iraq to fight terrorism. You believe this shit? Uh, contract needs 100, so Sheikh Abbas is going to make sure that everybody gets, uh, provides 25, 20 to 25 uh, workers. Their 100 guys will be here at 7. We'll bring them in, search them, and we'll be ready to work at 8 o'clock with these guys. These are the, some of the shakes around the area where we just moved into. The idea is to, to bring them in, have them work on our cops, and show them that we trust them, and, and in, the, in the same respect, they'll trust us. Um, we've already got some reporting on some of the gentlemen here, particularly the gentleman sitting next to Captain Thompson, where we've got reporting saying that he's holding Al-Qaeda meetings at his house. How much flus do they get a day? <laughs> they, have a, they have a choice. They can either work with us or against us. So hopefully, with us trusting them and they trusting us, they'll choose to work for us since we can provide them money and resources rather than Al-Qaeda having to do the same for them. Sit down, man. Where were you at yesterday, doofus? They all sleep in. Okay, come on. One at a time, one at a time. This guy here was a uh, general back of Saddam's army, and after the uh, removal, he lost power. So now he's trying to make a living working for us, <laughs> trying to get a paycheck. No, no, la, 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 no, 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 are you sure? That's it. Oh, oh she's gone. She gone. <laughs> you, my friend. Oh, okay, there it is. I had something to go on my keychain. Thank you. Go. Oh. Hey. My uh, 
extremely important, daunting task today is to take out the trash using these uh, lovely gentlemen working for us, these local nationals. But I guess they'd rather pick through the trash and take the bag out. We call these guys the Smurfs because of the way they're dressed. Sometimes people call them a blue man group, but the real name is the Smurfs. It's a, it's a term of affection though, we love them. They do a lot of work for us, they're good guys. A few weeks ago these guys were trying to blow us up with IEDs. Now they're picking up our trash. That's progress. That's uh, another up, step up. in Iraqi freedom. Them. Cleaning up this place one day at a time. Oh, it's on now. Is that a chuckle? Don't go to work. That sucks. That looks like a fucking chuckle. Giggle, giggle. Teddy's always so good. Yeah, Teddy's watching you. Mm-hmm. Pissing me off. It's like this close, man. It's been slammed so much. <laughs> oh, Teddy Akbar. Teddy Akbar. Yes! It works. <laughs> wow, thanks, Teddy. <laughs> that is money, bro. I want to go home. I want to go home. Teddy Akbar. Sweet. <laughs> Remember back when D, the hard, the hard, you never know the hip hop, take this far. Center, the opposite of a winner. Remember when they used to eat sardines for dinner? And make sure you guys keep uh, some uh, cover between you and the river. We're, we're meeting with uh, Sheikh Kareem, his brother Sheikh Aziz. Sheikh Aziz um, has uh, close associations with multiple uh, Al-Qaeda leaders in this area. He's connected to some, some soldiers that were kidnapped and killed uh, by Al-Qaeda uh, within the last year. We don't let people on the river during the evening hours and we're very uh, limited on where we let them cross during the day due to the fact that Al-Qaeda use the river as a uh, barrier between us and them and they'll cross, uh, they'll attack us and then cross back over the, to the other side. But we're going to give them one crossing point so that their commerce and their daily routine can get set again. Can they go across now? It's safe now that I'm here. So the women and people can cross this river at this point during the daytime. I see you've already got the checkpoints on this side. Uh, as soon as the checkpoint is on that side and this, this area is secure, yeah. I think we can start getting some people down here to start build, rebuilding this bridge. Yeah.
قد روحت يا بطل make sure you guys know I've ended uh, at this point we're out where nobody's been before Roger all this we attacked by a Qaeda before uh, three months ago the shooting in the glass and the house did uh do you have your own security element here to protect you from Al Qaeda now no Qaeda now okay so who's, who's nice house is that? Oh, this is my father and yeah. brother house. Yeah. This is me and my house. Okay. This is my father and the brother house. You know, obviously things are better. Uh, so he come back and uh, it, it, I'd, like, I'd be curious to just hear what he has to say. If he's uh, available to come back or if he, when he feels comfortable. Uh, all people not be very, very peaceful now and return again. But many of them coming. But there's many of them was killed another and they afraid of the family uh, revenge. Must we uh, find solution for them uh, and return again. Uh, you let them know now that it's, uh, we support that. We want them to come back to their original yeah. homes. <laughs> A lot of these things uh, we call it the counterinsurgency fight really are are different than what the armies used to fight. It's difficult. Uh, as you see, so a lot of the soldiers, uh, they don't understand it, um, you know, whether it's handing out money or why are we going to give these people, you know, food all the time. And, and it's not the violent video game, army video game uh, that, that they see or that a lot of people see. We're not here to take over Iraq. We're here to get them back on their feet. And as soon as they're on their feet, you know, I want to leave just as much as they want me to leave. <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah. And for some of these other guys, for some of the things they've done, yes. I hope mm -hmm. when I can. Yes, yes. Okay? Thank you. I will phone you about this thing. Okay. For now, it's all we got. <laughs> Bullshit! Hey, okay. Who's on our team? Wait, hold on. Who'd you pick so far? Uh, and, 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 and these three? Yeah. We want Chandi. Well, Chief, right, get your ass over here. You're on our oh. team. Oh, oh. Back home you have your friends. You have friends that say, oh, I have your back no matter what, this and that. Maybe they mean it, you know, they haven't had the opportunity yet to show you. But the guys over here, I mean, they literally have your back. Like brothers, you gotta look at it like, yeah, that's my brother. Yeah, we didn't grow up together. But shit, I've been living with him for a while now. It's been a year, and I've been living with these guys nut to butt this whole time. Buddy, back home, it would just be some guy you hang out with, some guy. Uh, you go out, drink, eat with. Buddy out here is like family out here. That's what we are, just family. Just trying to fucking make a big, happy family go back home alive. Most of my career running around war zones in different parts of the world was usually with very strange rebel armies, uh, drugged up rebels. I mean, I've worked with the British forces, I've worked with the Australian forces, the French forces. I had never really worked with an American soldier in my entire career. 
and I was really surprised, just fine. Kids, normal kids. Are the guys that found the stuff? Are those the people who go? Yeah, yes. Yeah, we do. We For all these guys? Yeah. He said, he said if you give them the money, so the, all the day, all tomorrow and the next day they will they will they will search all the land. Yes. That's what I want. I want them to keep finding all the uh al <laughs> Complex. Get the people to uh to trust you. Try to make them see that the uh not as bad as the militias are, and that the uh, extremists are uh, aren't going to help them uh, fix their problems. They just create more problems. And uh, a lot of times that requires uh, not necessarily going out and killing all of them, but going out and paying most of them. Talk to me about waking up day after day in Iraq. Uh, I just wake up each day, just counting down the days. Like, all right, get this day, you know, get over this day. That's one day closer going home. It takes some getting used to. Like the first, like probably like three, four months, I was just like, "Fuck, I'm, I'm in Iraq," and then that's all I can really explain. It sucks. It, it's the worst feeling in the world waking up and being like. I'm fucking in this shithole. This shit completely sucks. Totally. I mean, well, it. It's my. It's the first time of me being away from my family this long, and I don't mean my mother and stuff like that. I'm, I'm past that part. But uh, I guess mainly, um, uh, I'll, I'll sweep your floor when I'm done. I promise. But I just mean mainly, uh, you know, my son and my wife. It wears on you. Uh, it's, it's hot or it's cold, you, you, you do stuff you don't want to do every day, fucking, it sucks wearing all that shit out here when it's 140 degrees and you're running around, fucking dealing with that bullshit. Knowing that someone's out there trying to kill you, and sometimes you feel like your hands are tight because you're doing all these hearts and mind things, and sometimes it's necessary, but just when you see your friends go in and out the gate, you wonder if they're gonna come back. And I've had to deal with two friends that have um, they're never coming back. So it just, it's hard on you. It's hard on you mentally and physically. Sometimes I wake up and get a, you know, feel of accomplishment. We did something good. Some days it's just like, is this nightmare ever gonna end? It's a tribe, which is pretty funny when you think about you're in this land of tribes and tribal mentality. But over there, the customs that the Baker boys develop are the things that make them like brothers. It's the world they create in a violent place to assure their own survival. 
we're here, if we just protect this, if we just protect what we've got, we're all going to get out of this alive. You're over here risking your life in one of the worst places on the planet. And back home, opinion polls say that the majority of Americans don't think this war is worth it. I, I, I don't know why I'm over here, honestly. They said weapons of mass destruction, fucking nobody found any WMDs. Um, and then they said war for oil, fucking. Well, to me, if it was a war for oil, the way gas prices are at right now back in the States, that's, I'm all for it. You know, fuck it. At least we're bettering the United States by, by being over here. But uh, gas prices are still going up, so obviously it ain't for oil. Um, so what the fuck is it for then? I, I don't know. I can't blame them. In March of 2003, coalition forces invaded Iraq. Seven years later, more than 100,000 American troops are still there. In 2008, I picked up my camera and headed back to the big sandbox and met up with Baker Company of the 115 Infantry. I made a deal with them. I'm willing to die with you if you're willing to talk to me. This is what I saw. I'm going to Disney when I get home. Like I, I do every now. year. I go to Disneyland every day, you know why? Do a line of coke off your mom's ass. Ew. I'm not saying like put the military aside, but you know, you gotta take a second, calm down, relax, you know, and just just hang out. No air assault today. It's gonna be quite old fun day. Might fall off the bird, maybe eat shell, I don't know. Maybe the whirly bird goes off, maybe we don't go back down, mate, I don't know. You can't be hard charging and balls of the wall through, you know, 13, 14 months over here because, I mean, n nobody could take that. Garcia, Royal, Present. Kester. Present. Here. Oh. You guys already done this before, right? Got yeah, a couple key things. We start getting engaged, we don't have wheels down, don't shoot out my door, so we'll take care of it. Okay, aircraft yours. Where's the dog? You're next to the fucking dog. Fuck. I'm not get bit, man. You won't get bit on the bird. Okay. I promise you that. All right, sweet. Salmon Park in the Southern Bowl region was known as a tough neighborhood. Two American GIs known as the Dust One soldiers had been taken hostage by insurgents. Army intelligence picked up rumors that there was a chance they might be hidden in the area. No one talked about it because it was classified. But part of this mission was to go down and find any evidence of had they been there. And indeed, were they still being held in that area? When we go out the gate, I always say a little prayer. Living with fear is a 24-7 thing here in Iraq. Tell me about fear. I don't know about it. There was days you go out to roads and I'll admit it, your asshole so tight you can't fit, like put a needle up that. You're just waiting for it and you know it's coming. And a lot of times I'd be like scared as hell, but I can't show my soldiers that because my, so my soldiers look to me to lead from the front. You can't show any emotion here. You know, you can't show any concern for anybody. Uh, you can't show any weakness. You don't think about it. Yeah, you just block it out like fucking. Ah. 
I'd be lying if I said I was never scared. I've, I've been scared shitless over here. What's there to be afraid of? Dog team to enter uh, house number one over. Start searching this local area. Talk me through a firefight. What's happening to you? It gets fun. I say it gets pretty fun after after the first few times. You enjoy it. You find yourself hoping, you know, maybe today we'll go out and get into something because it's getting boring, not doing anything, just doing a normal patrol. Nothing happens, and you kind of like. Yeah, man, hopefully somebody shoots at us today. That way we can, you know, have some fun, go out and play a little bit. It's our body armor. It's our body armor. Crush wire. It's stripped in the middle, and when you drive over it, it breaks and it ignites the IED. It's got this battery right here that's hooked up to it. Days of land without the ride. That's what a rock is. The relationship between soldiers and journalists is always. And with American soldiers, it was particularly delicate. Um, I was walking with one of the soldiers on a patrol and um, asked him if he'd be interested in doing an interview. And nah, I just said, you know, why? And I said, well, I'd like to uh, know what you're thinking and feeling. And he said, guys like you don't care what I think. Guys like you don't care what I feel. And I said, well, what guys like me? And he's like, journalists. You know, we have journalists come in, they see us all the time. They say the exact same thing. We want to know what you're thinking. We want to know what you're feeling. And all they really want is just me to take a bullet while they're rolling their camera. I really don't know if, and to be honest, um, I've been that road that, you know, you go out and that, that's part of the gig. You go out and you get violence and you capture it. But um, anyway, sorry. All right. So I realized I had my work cut out to gain the trust of these guys, that no, I wasn't there to see any of them die. And I'm a 57-year-old guy, and I'm running around with 19-year-old kids, and we're all wearing flak jackets and helmets. It was not easy. But after a couple of months of that, they started to warm up to me. And um, they got the idea that 
we made a deal. We made a deal. And the deal was I had to prove to them that I that I'd do anything with them. So it came down it, it came down to the it came down to this. I'm willing I'm willing to die with you if you're willing to talk to me. And it worked. One minute. God, bust the A. Cool. I wanna go home. The helicopter's coming. Uh, they're lying to us. It's gonna be a lot longer than that. Thing about it is, I know my purpose of why I do my. I do too. Why? I grab with my right hand. You don't drive with your right hand. You shoot, you put on the opposite side. Reason why. When you pull up, it comes in your non firing hand. You can still fire and still defend the goddamn closer tiger. Shut the fuck up. See how stupid you think? No, I'm saying. Take your knife out. Let's go at it. I hope you pull that dick out of your mouth. But in Alabama, in Alabama, that's how we do it. Make sure you get some good pictures of, of that, because it looks like it's got some non-standard modifications. Yeah, everything's greased up. Yep. Functional. These guys are bringing in these weapons caches. Some of them probably were the ones that buried them, uh, whether a year ago or two months ago. But uh, part of the reconciliation is uh, these guys uh, quitting Al Qaeda and uh, turning in those weapons. Where's the graveyard that they found the cache? The cache is not beside the graveyard. Okay. But who owns that cache? Abu Fatma. And Abu Fatma. Abu Nasr, yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. A lot of these guys putting IEDs in the street are poor teenage kids. You know, Al Qaeda was paying, the going rate for Al Qaeda was about 300 bucks for them for, to get these guys to work for them. Al Qaeda was paying kids to put bombs in rope. Yeah. So here you got a kid who's completely poor, and this guy says, puts a gun to his head, and says, All right, there's 300 bucks. You can either take 300 bucks and go put this you know, 35 pound thing next to the side of the road and then take, keep the money or I can kill you. You know what I mean? Is that really a bad guy, that kid? You guys are uh, welcome here anytime. Um, I know that you don't do it solely for money, that you do it for, uh, to provide the safety and security for your home. But if you'll allow me, I would like to give you uh, some money f to reward you for the, uh, your efforts and uh, also to, so that you could use the money to help your families. A lot of them just like the pride of being told that that was a good job. They may find a big cache and break it down into three or four parts so that they can get three or four rewards. But uh, we're willing to do that at this point as long as we can get these things off the, uh, out of the area so that we can be a little bit safer in the areas we go into. This uh, site as a jail of Al Qaeda before two months ago. Al Qaeda? Al Qaeda jail. Well, you want me to open it? You want me to lift it? They lift, uh, escape. Al Qaeda escape. Uh, I'm going to kick it, watch out. Yeah, like you want to kick? Yeah, like kick. <laughs> 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 Perfect. 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 When Saddam fell, Iraq broke apart along religious and tribal fault lines, Sunni and Shia. The Shias who had been repressed under Saddam Hussein and the Sunni power structure took that opportunity to go for the jugular ethnic cleansing. Killing school children, uh, killing cousins, killing brothers, 
The Shias had more people. They had basically taken over the Iraqi police force. So the Sunnis suddenly realized, we're not going to get through this one. Uh, we're losing. Groups started to sprout up called the Concerned Citizens in uh, Western Iraq. And uh, they would do things like try and get the insurgents out of their village, get some kind of security. Uh, the Americans caught this on, hey, this is a great idea. And from out of that came the Sons of Iraq. And that took a bit of registration, which was called the hiding process. Guys were brought in. They would have their picture taken. They would have their addresses given, contact information. And this served two processes. It created a local security force the Baker Boys could count on, as long as they were getting paid by the Baker Boys. And, you know, the Americans now have your thumbprint. I'd say about 90% of all these guys have ambushed the shit out of us. They have definitely pinned us down and we had to return fire. We probably killed some of their family and now they're here getting paid by us to work for us. So I guess if we pay better than AQI or Jams, whoever it is they're working for, they'll side with us. But I still don't trust them farther than I can throw them. The six, go ahead. That's long. Oh yeah? What's wrong with you? Why you look all mad? You a concerned citizen, CC? No, not yet. Are you enrolling? Dude, you had gangster, man. I just want to fucking box your ears in. That's the challenge of fighting a counterinsurgency warfare. It's not like you look through the scope of your weapon and you know, hey, that's a bad guy. I'm pulling the trigger. They all wear the same clothes. They float back and forth in the same places. You got some of them who care and some of them who don't. Some of them who want to see you there and then some who really just you know, you can see it in their eyes. They hate you. They hate you with everything they have. Yeah, you have the small amount of people that um, we call SOIs, Sons of Iraq, or Concerned Citizens, that help us to help them. You can't tell the difference because they all look the fucking same. They don't wear no uniforms. So you don't know if you're, one day you're talking to a fucking good guy or fucking the guy's gonna try to kill you later. There's plenty of them that don't like us here. They don't want us here. They don't want our help. And that's not going to stop us from accomplishing the mission. Y'all do us good jobs when y'all stick to this. We don't have to worry about y'all too much. Stay with that. It's good. Yeah. Uh, the word is like a man. Besides your arm. Now you look somewhat wholesome. You look presentable. Well, I mean, this is what you do. You get them hooked on this, and then you don't have to give them money no more. They'll work for tobacco. They don't get this shit in, in Iraq. Hey. He said, uh, this uh, good guys, they now try to make uh, son of Iraq in that area. And they try to come here and make high system and uh, go with you and uh, show the checkpoint. If you don't mind, can you make that? Hey, hold up. Take his number out of his name. Where did that come from? Yes. Hey, uh, CA, did you get audio on those shots? Hey man, you guys are crowded my field of view. Hey Michael, bring it back to the gate till I get back over there, right? Hey, one golf. This is six. Did you get audio on those shots? Hey, uh, scan to the vehicles nine. All right. If you got uh, binos, get them out. It's just maybe a single pair, but just keep uh, vigilant, anyways. The great cliche about war is you don't know what it's like until you've been there. The stress, the tension that it takes to stay focused in that kind of situation is very, very, it's a tough trick. Good, all right, good, Teddy. All right, and and to be able to flip from that kind of tension yeah. to shaking hands and taking pictures with shakes, I mean, <laughs> man, well, we'll get you a what a job. Is it, is it, dep it depends on where, no, where no, you're at. No, 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 it doesn't no. depend on where you're at. It's all about like, all right, say, yeah, GTO, whatever, but somebody pulls up in a fucking tricked out Supra. Oh, shut up, Bozio. You sound like you got new stuff. Fazio, what do you think? Yeah. You think you could pull more ass in a rice burner or a fucking just regular straight American muscle car? Depends on where you're at, though, what I'm saying. So I need to bring this on here. If you ride there and and say Hulk pull in a tricked out super and you pull in there a GTO goddamn headers and blowers, who you think gonna get more females? You're fucking crazy. It depends on where you're at. California said muscle. Florida, 
Muscle. Blow that know how. Muscle. Give me nasty. Cross that line. Cross that line. What could you pull more acid? A, muscle, a fucking man. rice burner or American muscle? American muscle, baby. The growl of a V8 will get any kind of pussy wet. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else. The reason why they call me Black Nasty is because I am the funniest motherfucker you will ever meet in this world. I will do shit that will knock your fucking socks off. That's me. Do you realize how fucking long I've waited to be in front of a camera to rant about this shit? I'm getting it out. And we're living in a goddamn hole. A hole, goddamn it! A fucking hole! You got people over here that are getting fucked up for no apparent reason, and all I can say is, oh, it's for the betterment of Iraq. Well, look around you. We're still in a hole. People are still wiping their ass with their hands, and guess what? It still sucks around here. Yeah, yeah, so that's my fucking 15 minutes of ranting, and it took me four and a half fucking years to get that out of my system, and I feel fucking better about it now. Um, I need to go masturbate. It's our, it's our crib right here. Yeah, this is where we stay. So substandard housing. I had to show you MTV, this is how we live in. That's a $20,000 entertainment system right there. We're a short timer, so uh, we're leaving soon. I'm leaving next month. Hi, America. Hey, honey, I'll be home soon. Shut up, man. <laughs> It's a war on both ends. Let's, let's put it like that. It's a war on both ends. It's a war here and it's a war in, in your love life. Because the deployment is so long and you have to wait so long just to, to be able to feel that person, to be able to hug that person again. And knowing that it could end like that and you cannot see that person again. And there's been a lot of relationships broken because of it. Let's talk about long distance love and war. Don't do it. But I got a real good woman, a real good woman. And you know, God has blessed me with a, a, a real good son as well. Hey, your loved one back in the States, you know, she's talking about, you know, she had an argument with somebody over the phone about paying a bill or something like that. And you just don't have patience for that. And you're like, whatever. Everything that happens back home, I kind of zoned out. And everything that's happening here, I just focused on. When I don't call because I'm having a bad day because they want to tell me about their problems, I just, I don't want to, I get fed up. I don't want to hear it. They don't understand that I, a bad day means a really bad day. It means a horrible day. A lot of these people are friends I went to school with, and I get to keep in touch with them on here and see pictures of everything they're doing back home. So sometimes you see pictures of friends, though, and you wish you were there. I used to say love knows no boundaries, but I guess it did have a boundary and it was Iraq. I love her to death. I love her everything part of my heart, but it's just, you know, get to use that love out here, so it's really hard to show her that you love her or tell her how much you love her on the phone. I called her on the phone and she told me that the relationship was over, that she was leaving me. She wouldn't really give me that great of an explanation. She told me she couldn't do it anymore. She guided me through the dark. She was my strength. She was my rock. But unfortunately, you know, we, our relationship, our, not our love, our relationship wasn't strong enough to survive. Ten, twenty, thirty. Thirty-eight thousand three hundred. Thirty-eight thousand three hundred. Wow. You can help me recheck. This should be ten, twenty, thirty-five, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-eight, three. Here's how we pay these guys. We give the group leader six hundred bucks. He's the guy who's in charge of all the guys at the checkpoints. Then he's allowed to have four managers. Each of those guys get four hundred fifty dollars, and then each worker gets three hundred bucks. So you got to do the math and all that, and then he gets a, a little sum out of that. Yeah. It's more money than probably sixty percent of Americans make in a year. If this saves one kid getting shot, regardless of whether he's killed or just hurt, 
you know, it's, it's worth it. But then on another on another hand, you think to yourself, well, what if the humpy was never over here? <laughs> money and candy. All you need in this world right here, money and candy. All I know is where I'm at right now, and this makes sense and seems to be working now. Um, I wish it was going to my bank account, but fortunately it's going to uh, Shake Latif's. Yeah, I don't know the money. The money thing is is crazy, and that was something I, I completely was not prepared for. I learned how to conduct raids, conduct ambushes, conduct reconnaissance missions. You know, no one ever told me about you know building a foreign internal defense. That was never a class I got. So, all right, today we have twenty-eight thousand five hundred dollars today. You guys have earned it, and you deserve it. And it, this this money goes back into the community and will we'll help a lot of people. And I remember when you know the, the ideas first came out that, hey, we're gonna start recruiting locals to pull security on their own neighborhoods. We're gonna put them at checkpoints, um, organize them, and start paying them. There was a lot of discussion about that. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The money has an effect, and it is influencing behavior far more than, than any other weapon system we have. Okay, okay. do you want a bag for this? <laughs> Thank you. A lot of kids in this village. No, 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 no. No. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have orange juice? No orange. Uh, I've got iced tea. Iced tea? Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Maybe he'll remember. And this village village uh, puts a huge stake in the uh, Al Qaeda's heart as they sit here and watch us download this and the people uh, realize they don't need Al-Qaeda or militia to, uh, to support their village. Uh, as the Al-Qaeda sit here, and they're mixed in with this crowd and watch, uh, they lose their power base, and we gain some ground today. Since we've been out here, we've repaired water wells. These people now, I mean, we spent like 10 to 20 million dollars in civilian aid just alone. A whole village doesn't have water. We'll bring them water, schools, hospitals. We're paying them to clean up their own town because our town has trash all over the side of it. Uh, we spend your, your guys' tax money to help them fucking clean up their own streets, so. Buffalo, in America? Uh, I live there. Bed, bed. Like my house, bed. Buffalo. And this, this says Buffalo. That's where I'm from, buddy. Isn't that cool? What do you think of the media, how they've covered this war? Yeah, they always show they always show the bad stuff. I mean they don't they don't show a lot of the good stuff, but it make it makes better news they're doing their job, it's bullshit. I mean they don't show half the shit that goes on over here. They're only highlighting the worst parts of this war. Twelve soldiers were bombed and killed, um, four Marines were killed today, etc. They don't they don't tell the the truth. They tell what they need to tell to get their story, and it's not the truth. Wolf Blitzer doesn't give a fuck about me. Anderson Cooper and his fucking very smart haircut doesn't give a shit about me. Bill O'Reilly doesn't give a fuck about me. They don't get the, the little stuff that happens, the little interactions, the small things that happen with just, you know, making a difference. All we are is numbers. We're a fucking digital camo set piece. Mr. No. Oh. Mr. 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 No. You give me this. Mr. 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 From where? Mr. 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 Mr.
not gonna lie. Sir, Fisher, Fisher. Ah, oh, my head hurts. You're talking too much. Why are you talking? I don't know what you're saying. What? Bye. Oh God. How frustrating is it for these soldiers? They were trained to hunt down, kill, or capture the enemy. Is there a level of frustration with these kids that they just want to say, "Oh fuck you," or oh, "fuck it," and just you know take these guys out? I mean, how, they're not trained to be diplomats, but they're diplomats now. Uh, I hope they feel that way because I feel that way on a lot of occasions and, 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 and if I'm the only one feeling that way then I, then I, I feel like I'm out of place. Um, you can't forget that none of us were, were brought up or trained specifically for the counterinsurgency fight. These guys are just as well trained as, as I am now. So what you're, excuse me, what you're telling me is 18, 19, 20 year old kids with guns in uniform are handling the foreign policy of the United States in Iraq. It, in our own small little, you know, they say Captain Thompson and Baker Company, this is your area of Iraq. Um, I need you to fix it. Oh. 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 Wait. Push it back. Right there. Ah. Well, the guy is fucking pick this up. Fucking put pressure right here. You, you feel that shit? You feel that shit? That's the model. Who got that top off first? And, and that shit is a lot of fucking pressure. And you know what? Our Minister of Electricity is three hours late. We're supposed to go down to some power lines, let them analyze it to see how they will build it. And we're still waiting. Transform from Sergeant Williams to Empire. Oh yeah. Empire's in the house, baby. All day, baby. Like you ain't said. Ha! Do you use this a bar of soap? Fuck yeah. Have you ever used have you ever used a loofah? For like no, a poof? I, I would have watched it. Because loofahs are the shit. They get the soap and they get the dead skin off. It makes you feel clean. Hey, who the fuck invited Hinker on this fucking trip with us? Me! Yeah, Inger, we fucking don't like you. I'm rolling with you. We're just we're gonna start fixing these power lines so we can start getting power to the area. No, he's telling me he's talking about compensation for something here. Sheikh Kareem told him later, not right now. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. With his uh, sons of Iraq, we, we would like to come down and register uh, and start a contract for security for your village. Okay. Okay. This okay. okay. If they try to make us do a soft knock air assault, I'm gonna fucking kill someone. People will get thrown around. <laughs> Babies will be spared. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All depends on the mood. Or someone would just shoot at us. This is boring. Are you going on us going with us on the air assault? Uh, EFP hit the side of the Bradley I was in and just burned it all down to the ground. And I ended up going to the hospital. My mom was getting married two days later. And lucky for me, I got out to the hospital the next day and then caught a flight and went back. Tell me about the um, personal costs you paid in fighting this war. I spend more time here than I do at home. That's a cost. It takes away from my son. You know, I. I always get mad when I think, you know, I grew up with no parent, I grew up with a bunch of staff, and now my son's growing up with no father all the time. You know, my wife is teaching him how to throw a baseball, taking him to baseball practice, I should be there for that. You know, my daughter, she'll be four in June, and I think total, 
I've been around for maybe 19, about 19 months of her life, you know, so. I'm not there when my wife comes home and she's pissed. And who's she gonna tell, my son? <laughs> you know, is she gonna tell the dog, a Rottweiler, you know? She doesn't even like the dog. It's my dog, you know? Well, my wife gave birth a couple days ago. I, I'm torn between, you know, I'm missing all this in my family. I want to be home. I don't want to do this anymore. And then I'm just like, this is this is who I am. This is what I do. This is my job. My wife understands me being here more than I do sometimes. She's just like, you know, do your job, come home, and and and, and you know, one, one day this will all be over, and you know, we we'll, you know we we'll, won't we'll, we'll have to do all this anymore. Yes hard, but like I said, if it's something you truly believe in, you just learn to appreciate that someday you will be able to make up for the difference, hopefully. It cost my family, it cost my family more than it did me. Yeah, they pay more than I do. Basically, the, you guys understand that the task is to clear these buildings uh, in order to confirm or deny uh, the activity that the Dust One personnel were there. When those two guys went missing, it was a pretty well coordinated attack and plan. So really what we're doing is we're confirming or denying that, that this course of action for those, miss, those two missing guys came through this area. It's an air assault into there, but more of a soft knock, kind of a, you know, we're not going in there to wreck shit. Don't hesitate to escalate it up should the uh, situation uh, warrant it. But the idea here is to get in and get to, get these people to give up some intel so that we can confirm or deny whether or not our buddies uh, are, ever came through this area. All right, guys, that's all I got. Thank you. The funny thing is the hardest thing we have to do as leaders is to get guys to shoot. American soldiers are, are American kids. They are not killers. We have to train them to do that job. We don't train them to be killers, we train them to be soldiers. And part of being an infantry soldier is having to, when faced with the situation, kill an enemy, bottom line. You're trained to do it, I'm confident in that. But just understand, watch what you wish for, because you just might get it. I know everybody wants to test themselves. Uh, but trust me, as you stay in the Army long enough, you'll have plenty of opportunities to, to do what it is you think you want to do. Kill a man. Yeah. He said we, we have a problem between us, between uh, my family and the other family. Tell them that's no problem. Tell them we're looking for this guy for a reason. We're gonna we're gonna detain him. He just needs to show us the right house. Tell him he's not going to be released for a very long time. You don't have to worry about that. He's going to walk there with us and he's going to point out the right building. And after that, he doesn't need to come up to the building with us. He doesn't even need to come in with us. He said, I come with us uh, to. Uh, That's too easy. That's too easy. I'm Ron Talish Ali. I'm here, Talish Ali. Uh, I thought his son. 
It's his son. Yeah. He's got to show me that house. No, Tell him to come outside right now and show me where that house is. I just get down a queer bit. I don't I'm going to ask him one Sometimes you go out there, you go, you do an air assault in the middle of the night to a village. You, uh, oh. you, uh, you arrest a suspected bad guy. Mm -hmm. And you always, at the same time, there's the family, there's the wife, there's the mother, there's the, the kids sitting there looking at you and you're taking their father. When you look in their eyes, do you feel anything for them? No. They, they know, they know what, uh, their dad was doing, you know. They know he was trying to kill us. I don't, I don't think he gives a shit about our families, you know. So do I give a fuck about his? No. Mm -mm. Seems like he has some intelligence value on him, so we'll let some of the interrogators get some further information and uh, see what comes of it. That's next. Put him in the corner, man. Fuck this. You don't need fucking room. Yeah. No one told me if the guys they arrested that night had any useful intelligence. But a few weeks later, the bodies of the Just One soldiers were found in another area of operations. They'd been murdered by their captors. Kind of makes a bad guy out here. Fucking shit. One of my buddies got a. They got. He got hit with the EFP a few months back. He lost a. Low, uh, lower part of his leg. I mean, sometimes it kind of pisses me off just sitting here watching these guys because it's like he could have planted that, you know? He could have planned that IED that fucked up one of my buddies. And sometimes I just want to want to take it out on them, but you can't. You got to hold back. I mean, we're trying to help these people out, and if I mean, they're trying to disrupt us from helping, you know, help their own people out. That's a bad guy to me. I've seen Humvees cut in half by fucking, by explosives, you know, and RPGs and everything like that. I, and it's, it, it's, when you climb that vehicle, you know, you, sometimes, you know, you don't know if that's gonna be your last time ever climbing in that vehicle. I got blown up back in July. It was like my, it was my last IED. And uh, the entire Bradley, we got trapped in there. And uh, I almost, I almost, I actually contemplated shooting myself because I couldn't get out to Bradley and I didn't want to die burning alive. Tell me about your worst day in this place. Um, it sucked. <laughs> I smoked like two packs of cigarettes in an hour. <laughs> this is after something. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, I lost two of my friends. And that, that's all I want to say about it. I uh, lost them. <laughs> what can he do? He's fucking, he was doing his job, being a fucking hero. Something a lot of people don't know how to be. The only way you could become a hero in this fucking world is to die. Give everything all. Shot right in the diaphragm. Just one, two, three, go. Come on. All right. All right, there we go. All right. He's got gunshot wounds right to his diaphragm. Exit wound left, kidney. 
you want them, Doc? Right here on the table. Right, can I be? Yep. Come on, give me an interpreter, please. How you doing, buddy? Hey! I'm a bit. This kid was shot at a checkpoint, and the people that brought him in said that it was an accident he shot himself. Did you get a fucking line going or what? Yeah. You know, it was a drive-by, but they just wanted us to think that it was an accident because they didn't want to present to the Americans that they were losing control. Because if we lose control, then we won't get the money. Then, you know. Hey, What's his name? Nagin. Yeah. Yeah. Keep looking at me, all right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Stay right here. Yeah. 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 My experience in war is not usually in organized theaters. It is places of revolution where society basically falls apart. The thing that has always gotten me in my my life in these places is the people caught in the middle. I don't know how to describe the guilt, I guess, of how many times I've had to go into a place, take pictures of people suffering, take pictures of people being slaughtered, dying in my camera lens. And them thinking I'm there to help by telling their story to the world. Which in my head, I was a journalist, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to get the truth out. I was trying to be the bearer of terrible truths so maybe the world would understand. But the worst part is always you leave them behind. These are uh, just my KIA bracelets for my friends that have that we've lost over here this time. Uh, Corporal Tito Polito and uh, Corporal Winterbottom and Soren Greca. IEDs and everything have been a lot more complex. You definitely uh, kind of cringe at the fact that you know one could go off at any second. They just hit a pressure switch. I mean, it's hit or miss. It's, it's pretty fucking random. Either you hit it or you don't. And. Uh, Yeah, just pretty much so you remember them. So like, hey, this is this is my friend. It's a way of like keeping them with you. Like this was my friend uh, that I used to hang out with and that we've been through some bullshit together and now they're fucking gone. It's just a way, I guess, of remembering them and keeping them with you and shit, so. Last question, when you lay your rifle down, when you go home and you're, um, you're with the person you love, the person you trust more than anyone in the world. And that person looks you in the eyes and says, James, tell me the truth. What was it like? What are you going to say? I can't tell you. I can't tell you what it's like. You know, how, how are you going to, how can you look somebody in the eye and tell them, man, I've had killed people? How can you look somebody in the eye and tell them, fucking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt, you know, fucking that my body is just so beaten up and destroyed. Tell me the truth. Tell me what it was like. What are you going to say? I don't know if it can be described in uh, words to someone who doesn't experience it. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's exciting, it's fun, it's disgusting. I, it can't be described in just simple words. It's something that has to be experienced.